Good morning. Great to see you this morning. I trust you've had an amazing passion weekend so far. Um, who's had ayers, eggs, Easter eggs? Ah, okay, okay, okay. Confession session at the church, eh? Wonderful. I want to ask you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 16. Before I get into the Word, I want, I want to, to help you understand one principle. It's, it's an idea that I want to leave with you this morning. And if, if you get this idea, then I probably don't even think it's needed for me to preach too much. On Friday morning, we spoke about the fact that the cross is an instrument. It's a tool. Remember? We spoke about the fact that the cross is a tool of suffering. We spoke about the fact that the, the cross is a tool that silences the enemy. And we said that the cross is a tool that also restores God's original intent. The cross is a powerful, powerful tool. But this morning I want us to put a, a different focus on the cross. And this focus has got to do with the fact that the cross also marks a spot. It is a very important place. If you understand that idea that the cross is a very important place, then this morning, the resurrection of Jesus will, will get you vibrating with life, with power, and with hope. So I want to explain this, this idea of place to you. Please make a note in your, in, your, in your notes. Just write the word preparation for the place. Just Preparation, that's the first concept I really want you to get. I want you to get this idea of preparing for a place. Then write down, second one, the importance of the place. And then the last one, the experience because of the place. There's a certain experience. Who likes to go to a certain place for holiday? Same place every year. People like that? What takes you back? This little girl is very excited. Where's your favorite holiday place, ma'am? Where? Mozambique. Why do you enjoy Mozambique so much? You don't know. It's fun. There's a favorite place for her. Why? Because there's an experience that's linked to that place. You all right? So the importance of a place is what I want you to get this morning. If you get the importance of a place... Resurrection Sunday is going to be glorious for you. There's a preparation needed when you come to the place. And when you come to the place and you understand what the place is about, you go with an experience. And so I want to ask my wife to come and help me try and explain this idea to you, settle this idea. Let's, if you would please stand on the corner of the stage over there. I'm going to stand on this side. The first time I saw this beautiful girl, I was 12 years old. And the thought when I saw her, I thought to myself, how will I know if that's not my wife? I mean, that's a great question to ask, I reckon. Outside of who is Jesus is the best answer or question that you can ask. Why was it such a big question for me? Because my mom was a social worker, and every day... I saw the reality of marriages that fell to pieces. I saw what alcoholism did. I saw what poverty did. I saw it. And so I realized, man, if there's one thing I want to get right, I want to find the right one. But who knows that at 12 years old, you're not particularly ready to get married. <laughs> and so I had to go through some preparation in myself. 
I had to work through some insecurities, some fears before I could get to the place of standing with my wife before the Lord and saying, this place, at this place we get united. She had certain preparation. Kom starig nader. She had, she had certain preparation that could get her to the place where she could stand next to me. Enjoy the picture. <laughs> and so just go back over there, let. There was preparation that I had to undergo from the age 12 to get ready to be prepared to find my wife, to get to a place in Ottosdal. Do you know where Ottosdal is? Anyone knows Ottosdal? It's a special place for me and her. The Enge Church there, the big building, that's the day, that's the place we met. That's the place this thing got formalized. And I tell you, the experience ever since has been glorious. But here's the thing I want you to see. I had to go get her. So listen, I like you. Would you like me a little bit? Just give me time, you'll get to really like me. You happy to, to just walk with me? I had to say, listen, can you... Would you, would you mind to, to marry me? <laughs> she said yes, but she says she does not mind at all. That preparation of the two of us together to get to the place where we could stand in Ottosdal, in the Enche Church, required a fair bit of preparation. Let's go back there, Alet, just to make the point. She prepared a dress. That took my breath away. She prepared a hall with all the people and all the guests. It took a certain amount of preparation on our side. I just, I just showed up on wedding day and looked pretty. She did all the preparation to get us ready to get to this place where we can say, before God and His people, we are uniting today. I need you to see this. The importance of a place. Otosdal. It's got a very special place for us. That's the place where we got united. Our union was cemented before God. Getting the idea? Happiness? So the build-up of our preparation took me seven years to get ready for Alet. I needed a lot of preparation. Luckily, she was patient. Seven years, we, I got prepared to take this woman and to call her my wife. When we got to the place and we got united before God, it led to an experience. Man, what an experience. I'm not talking about the first night alone. I'm talking about the experience of walking with her every day. The benefit of seeing and learning. Because now we won. We got prepared individually. We got prepared individually. I had to go and find her. But when we met, we got prepared individually. But when we met in the place, we got united. She's no longer a burger. She's now a labiskachni. That meeting place was so important, it transformed her identity. From this moment, she's walking with me as a labiskachni, not a burger anymore. Got you? You're getting the importance of the place? This morning I want to, don't care, let. This next is beautiful. I want you to get the importance of the place. I want you to get the importance of the place that the cross has in our lives. You okay? It's important. I need to get you to understand the preparation that gets you to the place at the cross. I need you to understand the importance of that moment, the importance of that place. And I need you to understand that there's an experience from that place onwards for the rest of your life. Happiness. You think you're getting the idea? Just to make sure, I prepared another example for you. This example is foreign to us because in... In the Transvaal, we, we farm with mealies. You put it in the soil, it dies, it produces more mealy. Happy? 
we're not wine farmers. And so this, I had to go find this clip to educate the Valleys, to culturize them according to the Cape Tonians. How do you farm with grapes? What's vitally important is the place. When you farm with grapes, the place where you prepare the stock or the vine to get grafted in is so important. There's a huge amount of preparation for the stock and for the vine to get prepared to the place where a grafting can happen, a union can happen. And when you find that place, when that grafting has happened, there's an experience, there's a, there's a result in how the vineyard starts to look. Happiness? Let's look at this AV clip behind me to help you understand. Look for the importance of the place, the placement of this vine. Thank you. So approximately two weeks ago, these vines were cut off. They literally cut off the tops of the vines and disposed of the cordons and the wood and the, and the trimmings and everything. And they basically let the vine just kind of sit there for a little bit. And as the time frame goes on, the bark starts to slip at the cambium. The cambium layer becomes very... Uh, is, is where we want to put the graft. And it's basically just putting a bud on top of the cambium layer so the cambium and the new bud have to adhere to each other in callus, and that's where it'll start. We know the vine is still obviously alive even though there's no fruit and no big canopy on it, but that gives a chance for this to, uh, to heal, to callus, and to start growing. So these were probably just grafted within the last week and therefore we don't see any green growth yet coming out of that little window between the tape. And generally a butter will put two buds on kind of an insurance policy. Uh, in case one doesn't make it, there's always a second chance for the, the second one to come through. It is a skill. It's not just anybody can go out there with a sharp knife and uh, just put a bud under there and call it good. So a skilled operator with a good sharp knife, I mean it has to be a sharp knife, has to make sure that bud is exactly flat on the back side so that the cambium is matching the cambium. And that's the key to successful grafting. And the, and the flaps actually help hold the bud tight as well to the cambium layer of the, on the trunk there. And then you can see when he wraps that he's wrapping very tightly to try to minimize all the air that's going to be in there to help keep it from drying out. But he's doing a chip butt on this one right here versus a T or an inverted T and he has a reason for that. He probably feels it's a better chance for a take in there and that's what he did is he removed a little piece of wood and he's doing a, a typical chip like you would on a rootstock. But again, just as long as cambium is matching cambium, that's the key. So they've already relieved the, the hydraulic pressure right here. The trunks have already been slashed to help keep the sap flow coming up while and let that have a time to heal. Otherwise, that sap flow would be too much on this open wound now and push that bud out theoretically. So they come in and pre-cut these, and that's what this bleeding is down in here. It's not going to hurt the vine. It's just a very shallow cut with a saw. Here's one that's already starting to push a little bit. Uh, again, I put a little nick in here in the trunk to relieve some of the hydraulic pressure and this one is actually starting to grow. And I think with all the warm weather, this is probably an indicator that this is going to take off pretty quick. And at some point then the crew will come through and start taking off the sucker so the energy and the effort can go into, into that new bud. The year of grafting is really the loss of 100% crop plus the conversion and then after that it's uh, going forward with your new variety or new clone. So I want you to get the idea of the, part, the importance of a place. This example, there's a little bud, there's a little fruit, a little leaf that starts to bud out. What is the end of that, that place where this bud gets placed in? What's the end of that result? Grapes. If you take it a bit further, 
Wine. Who minds? Who does not mind a glass of wine? Why? It's a nice experience. What's key in this example is to see how meticulously the preparation is handled. Did you hear? He says, not anyone with a sharp knife can prepare the grafting place. Not anyone. You have to be very skilled. You have to know how to use a knife. You have to know how to open up, how to cut a wound in that vine. And then you have to cut the graft similarly so that it can, it can find a place that's compatible. The more the cut is similar, the more compatible the meeting place. The place they get connected. Did you see that they wrapped? After the cut was made, they wrapped that thing with white some sort of type. I'm not sure what. It's amazing that all of that preparation goes into the cutting of the vine, the cutting of the graft under the master's hand. And then when they get joined in one place, they get wrapped up, tied together to make sure that the experience of this meeting place is protected. And then the little leaf starts to grow. It produces grapes. It produces fermentation, eventually produces wine. Great experience, isn't it? Let's read Matthew 16. Are you getting the importance of the place? That's what I want to help you understand. Place is important. Matthew 16, verse 21 says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And on the third day, be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Holy Spirit, this morning, I'm so mindful that what I'm setting out to do is to deal with what Paul calls a mystery. Father, when your word describes mystery, it it describes something that cannot be logically understood by reason. So this morning I come, and Father, I ask that, that you would give us the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, and discernment. I ask for supernatural knowledge this morning. I ask for supernatural understanding this morning. I ask that that which is mysterious because we cannot see, that you will come and that you'll make those things plain. Father, I thank you that you choose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. I ask that you'll help me to serve your people well this morning. That you will direct me and lead me to bring the centralia of the cross into our very lives, Lord, that we can bear much fruit. We bless you, Lord. We honor you and we welcome you this morning. Pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Matthew 16, we find Peter, man with an incredible revelation. He gets it. Jesus is the Son of God. It's like, oh, wow. Wow. I'm like, I mean, that must, must have been a revelation. Of note. I often thought I'd love to walk next to Jesus if he was a man. I'd love to walk next to him, man. 
knowing this is God, to see the stuff he does. But I've got, I've got one thing that I forget every time I think about how that must have been awesome. Can you for one moment picture how difficult it must be to believe that the man walking next to you is God? I was like, what? So when I realized that, I had a bit more appreciation for old Peter. And so he gets the mother of all revelations. This man next to me, he's God. But while he's walking with revelation, he puts his foot in it. Whoop. He says, Jesus, I am not going to allow you to get prepared for the importance of the meeting place that you say is so important. I'm not going to allow you, Jesus, to make this meeting place of death on a cross. I'm not going to allow you that privilege. I'm not going to allow you to serve the purposes of God that can bring a whole new experience to mankind. You see, Peter didn't understand that the cross in God's purposes was a divine meeting place. It was the most important meeting places of all. And so Jesus had to rebuke him. Say, Peter, who are you? You must be Satan trying to keep me from providing the meeting place, preparing the meeting place that God's people can be freed. Let's focus on the preparation real quick that you find in this passage. How did Jesus have to prepare himself to get to this meeting place? What preparation was needed? Verse 21 said, Jesus had to suffer. You see, suffering is the way that Jesus was prepared to provide this divine meeting place, this important meeting place. Suffering today still, suffering because of sin. We looked at that on Friday morning. What is the suffering tool? It's sin that's causing us to suffer. Jesus had to, prepare, had to be prepared through suffering. He had to be prepared through suffering to prepare himself to provide a meeting place at the cross for every single person that would meet him there. Now let me just help you with perspective around Jesus. We've just said that he is God. So let's for a moment just paint the scene so that you get it. This side of the cross is sin, is death, is a curse. Happy? Genesis chapter 3. God is commenting. He says, because you've given the authority to the enemy, the whole place is now, humanity is now under a curse. Happy? All of the earth is under a curse. This side of the cross. It's an important meaning place, eh? That side of the cross, what's there? There's not curse, there's blessing. There's blessing, there's life, there's prosperity, there's healing, there's power, there's wisdom, there's righteousness, there's fullness. This side of the cross is all of God's life, as God originally intended it. The cross is the meeting place between two worlds, the world of curse and the world of blessing. Now watch this. You are right? You awake? Where did Jesus come from? From which world? The world of blessing. The world of fullness. The world of overflow. Do you know that, it, that his mission was, he said this, I came to seek and save the lost. You know that? What does it mean? It means this. He left the place of blessing and he put himself and he subdued himself and he became a man. He lived into this place, into this world dominated by curse to find you. He was so committed in finding you that he was willing to make himself a curse. My goodness. Sinless, 
perfect, but the only place he could find you and me was in the place under a curse. And so Jesus said, I want to experience humanity in its fullness. I want to experience what it feels like to be a man living under the curse. You're right. So what great lengths does he go to to leave heaven, to come and find you, to become a curse so that the feeling, the experience of being a full man prepares him to get to this important place called the cross. If you doubt whether Jesus loves you, that should settle it. He left everything to prepare himself through the suffering, the rejection, the denial, the persecution, the misunderstanding, the mockery. All of that prepared him to to fully experience what you and I experienced as he came to fetch us from this world. Say, let's meet at the cross. Peter said, no, 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 you can't have that. That's how Jesus got prepared. How do you get prepared for the cross? Very simple. You just need to get to the place where the suffering that you're facing because of sin has to get you to the place where you say, I can't anymore. Not anymore. I I can't. I can't. I mean, it's this thing. It's disease. It is death. It is debt. It is all the stuff. There's no hope. There's no joy. You just need to get to the place where you are hutful saying, I can't anymore. That's how you get prepared to get to the cross. But if you're prideful, then you think, ach, nee, man, ek is mos, stark, man, I can do this thing, I can stand, just bring it. And God in His gracious wisdom says, no problem. The suffering you will face will eventually get you to the place where you say, can we just meet you at the cross, Lord? Now I'm ready. I need you to see this. As the suffering prepares you for the place. The suffering of sin that happens against you, it's the cuttings of sin that gets you to open yourself and say, Lord, I want you. It's the sufferings of sin that, what, that happened to Jesus. What, did, what happened to him? Jesus got cut. It says he got opened up. His body was bruised. His body was broken. He was beaten beyond recognition. That's what sin did to him. Think about it. You know that must be Jesus, but yes, it doesn't look anything like him. Imagine your husband being beaten that way. You know that's my husband. I'm just not, it just doesn't look like him anymore. What was happening? Jesus was being prepared to open himself up completely to get united with you. His body was broken open that he could receive you. His heart was broken open that he could receive you. His soul was shattered in two that he could receive you, that he could be opened up and prepared completely to receive you. He got to meet you at the level you were at. He had to get prepared for that. Wow. Gives you a new perspective on suffering even when you know Jesus. Do you know that the suffering that's still happening in our lives, it's just preparing you to celebrate this place even more. Get you to have more understanding of the importance of the cross. That's what suffering does for you. So what makes the cross so important? The cross is the place where Jesus says, I must die. It's one thing to suffer. The suffering prepares him. But at the cross, Jesus says, I must die here. This place is important. I must die here. Why? Why? Because the Bible says 
the fruit of sin leads to death. See, the suffering prepared Jesus, but it's in his moment on the cross where he dies, where he comes and he levels with you. He puts himself completely on your level in death. He makes it possible for you and me to reach out, to identify with him, to say, oh my goodness, I am dead as well, and so is he. And in that moment of the cross, in that moment of death, we become united, the playing grounds become level. As he dies and he levels, he opens himself up to receive me so that in death we can become united. I don't know about you, but that's quite a moment. It's quite a moment to think that God of heaven and earth would humble himself so much, lower himself so much, would get cut, would get broken, would be, would be broken open so that he'd be able to receive you and me, to become compatible with you and with me. He had no choice. It's the only place he could meet with humanity. It's the only place he could meet you. It's in the place of death. Why? Because you're dead already. Because of sin. So you have to, you have to listen to this. So this will change your life. What has happened? Why is this place so important? Why is this meeting place so important, sir? Why is the cross so important? It's the place where Jesus opens himself completely for you and me to come and be united with him. So please see this. My suffering with sin prepares me, gets me to the place where I say, oh my Lord Jesus, I want to find you here. Jesus comes from heaven. He gets prepared through all of the suffering and he opens himself, says, through my wounds and through my suffering, I'm available. I know what death feels like. If you would humble yourself, And bring yourself and say, Jesus, I come. I want to become one with you in this moment of death at the cross. In that moment, you get united with God. What makes that awesome? Why is that hoo-ha? Why is that good news on Resurrection Sunday? Why do we go, woo-hoo? Well, I'm the one that's going that way, it sounds. What makes that so awesome? It's what happens next. Death could not hold him. Why? Because he is the author of life. Where and who would you want to get connected to in death? With Jesus, why? Because death cannot hold him. And so what happens next in the story is so profound, even hell could not see it coming. This meeting place is so important, even hell could not write the Steven Spielberg, he could not see the script. Who would have thought, by humbling yourself and weakening yourself and saying, oh, I'm going to die with Jesus, I'm going to get united with him, who would have thought that life can come out of death? Who would have thought? You see, when you get united with him in death, (laughs) that's where this thing starts to get fun. As you reckon yourself dead, not just Jesus that's dying for you, you reckoning, man, I'm dying there with him. That cross is the place we're united. He died. For me, but I died with him. One parcel. United in death. Now, the resurrection life, the resurrection power can start to flow in your life. Why is it that there's so few believers 
enjoying the experience of life and resurrection power. Thank you for asking, sir. It's because of how poorly we prepare ourselves to meet him in this place. But now that I died with Christ, I died with him. Now we want peace, we want parcel, we want unit, one name. After three days, as hell is having a party, all of a sudden hell goes quiet. Because the author of life did what he does best. He gives life. I like this life. The Bible describes this life as the Zoe life of God. Have you heard that name? The word Zoe. Z-O-E. Double kolikis. I don't know what you call that in English for now. Zoe life. What I like about the Zoe life of God, it describes the life of God as the penalty paying life. When you unite with him, you get the benefit of the penalty paying life of Christ. The penalty for sin paid. What's the penalty? You have to die. Well, I've died already. So death has lost its sting over my life. The penalty paying life of God has paid it on my behalf. I got united in that moment of death. Now I don't fear death anymore. I've gone through it. How? By faith. You know this thing about faith. If you're at the base, you must have a definition at least by now what faith is. Faith is the thing so you can't see. But it's real. It exists. It exists in here. Faith is the substance. It's the conviction. The evidence is inside here. The evidence is not physical. So how do I get united with him? I get united in his death by faith. Can you show me? Biki mm, Mulak. Give me time. Until I get to 120 and I get to heaven, I'll show you the evidence. But for now I have this faith. The authority breaking life of God. This life is a disease-destroying life. It's a death-silencing life. What I like about this life, it is an atmosphere-changing life. Amen. I like that. I like it when, when sin is battling in on me and the world is coming at me. I love to remind myself of the importance of this place and turn to him and say, Jesus, thank you for your life and the atmosphere changes around me. The atmosphere changes inside of me. Do you like that? Do you know that? How? Well, very simple. I got united with him at the cross. How? By faith. Can you show me? Difficult, difficult. But I know it happened. We were made one. Me and Jesus, he got cut. Actually, he got bruised. Beyond imagine, I got cut by the work of the Spirit, the masterful knife. And in that moment, we met and our lives connected, me with him. And the Spirit came to seal that grafting that meeting place and now the life of God is starting to flow through me it might not look like much when you start it's a little bad only it's like yes, was that real a real graft when you start off after honeymoon you think yes everyone complains about marriage but it's so amazing and then you start to walk like, well, oh, there's one or two things we have to work out here. Might not look like much, but you keep celebrating your unity in death with Jesus. It's amazing how the life of Jesus, the resurrection life of Jesus starts to open you up, starts to grow you, starts to produce fruit on your life, starts to give you an experience. How? By faith. What is your faith based on? 
I got united with Jesus in death. And when he thought a time to wake up from the dead, I woke up with him. You will not believe it. Some areas of my life still looks dead, but by faith, those were part of the parcel. The life is flowing. The sap is flowing. The nurturing of the Spirit is flowing. It's producing something in my life. I said to you, I'm trying to explain a mystery to you. But if your lights start to go on, if the revelations start to go on, that you've been united, the place is the most important place of meeting. You know why? Because there was no alternative for God. God had to meet man at the cross. There was no other way for him to do it because man messed it up. God had to become a man to come and fix it at the cross. Where will you find God? Thank you for asking the question. I'm looking for God. Where can I find Him? You'll find Him at the cross. I want to experience God. You'll find Him at the cross. It's the only way that God could make Himself available for blessing. And unless you see yourself united in Him at the cross, you'll never know that blessing. You'll chase the Holy Spirit forever, not knowing that He lives inside of you already. How do you experience this life with God? How do you experience the resurrection reality this morning? How? Please help me. By? In what? The place of the cross. The place where death united you with Jesus. You are right, friends? Can I be honest? Some places in my life, they don't like dying too much. I've been united with them, but some places in my life, they don't like dying too much. There's still preparation happening in some areas of my life to fully understand, oh, wow, now I've got it all. I had it all, all along. I just need to learn to bow the knee and remember that I got united in death to Jesus. Why do you battle with addictions? Why do you battle the fear of death? Why do you battle the fear of relationships? Why do you battle rejection? and denial, and mockery. Why do you battle those things? It's because you've not realized, oh my goodness, it's preparing me to get united, to celebrate my unity with Jesus even more. Hey, some of you guys look like you've seen a ghost. That's the good news. Resurrection Sunday. Not just that Jesus defeated death, that you were included in that friendship. You were united with him. When it happened to him, it happened to you. Evidence? Hey, by faith, brother, by faith. Some of us need lots more faith because the evidence is nowhere in our lives. But I know it's happened. I'm united. We are one in death, so that now we are united, one in life. Amen. I want to show you that video clip again. You're right with that? I want to show you that video clip again, and I want to, I want to just want you to to listen to these scriptures before we get there, I want you to just listen to this. Paul describes his experience of unity with Jesus. Paul describes it. Galatians 2 verse 20, you know what he says? He describes his experience of, uni of union, the place of the cross, the place of union. He says this, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. What is he describing? He's describing how they became one. 
Jesus died for him, but he reckons himself to have been so united with Jesus in death as, as if he died there with Jesus. Is that your testimony? Is that your experience of your unity? That you've been united with Christ and that you no longer live. You've been crucified with Christ. You no longer live, but Christ now lives in you by faith. I want to read this scripture for you. John 15, a scripture you know so well. Listen to how Jesus is saying the same thing. The importance of the place. What happened at the cross? You got placed into the same death as Jesus. So that now you can live the same life as Jesus. Am I right? Did you get it that way, sir? Is that what the gospel tells you? You died with him. You united with him in death. So that now in life, you are united in his life. John chapter 15. I'm going to prepare you for this video clip, same video clip. Listen to this. It says in John 15, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Who's got the knife? Who's the man handling the knife? Who's the skillful guy with a, with a knife? God the father. He cut into Jesus the very place he had to graft you in. They put a spear in the side of Jesus. Jesus got opened up to receive you. It was precision cutting from God the Father. And then God the Father says, okay, let me prepare the, the graft for the site. Let's make sure that the cut on the graft will look exactly the same as that of the vine. The Father is the gardener. He's skillful with a knife. When the Spirit of God cuts your heart, He's preparing you to get united with Jesus. Are you all right? Verse 2, He cuts off every branch in me, Jesus says, that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes. So that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. How do you remain in Jesus? Remain in your union of death. Remain in your union of life. That happened at the most important meeting place in all of history of the world, at the cross. And then he says, remain in me, and I will remain in you. No man can bear fruit by itself. Well, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Did you hear how important this meeting place is? Do you hear how central the cross is to our faith? It's the place where Jesus died. Jesus got cut as he died. You and I got cut by the Spirit, so that we can meet together the perfect graft. What does he expect? As you celebrate this union by faith, he expects that fruit will start to show, that your life will start to look different, that power will start to flow, that the resurrection of Christ will be the testimony of your life. I used to be under a curse, but now I'm living in the blessing. Amen. I want you to look out. I want you to look out for the knife. I want you to look out for the marking, the cutting of the place. I want you to look out for the, for the sealing that happens. And look at how this fruit starts to bud. Look, look again. Thanks so much, Baron. So approximately two weeks ago, these vines were cut off. They literally cut off the tops of the vines and disposed of the cordons and the wood and the, and the trimmings and everything. And they basically let the vine just kind of sit there for a little bit and as the time frame goes on, 
the bark starts to slip at the cambium. The cambium layer becomes very, uh, is, is where we want to put the graft. And it's basically just putting a bud on top of the cambium layer so the cambium and the new bud have to adhere to each other and callus, and that's where it'll start. We know this vine is still obviously alive even though there's no fruit and no big canopy on it, but that gives a chance for this to, uh, to heal, to callus, and to start growing. So these were probably just grafted within the last week and therefore we don't see any green growth yet coming out of that little window between the tape. And generally a butter will put two buds on kind of an insurance policy uh, in case one doesn't make it there's always a second chance for the, the second one to come through. It is a skill. It's not just anybody can go out there with a sharp knife and uh, just put a bud under there and call it good. So a skilled operator with a good sharp knife, I mean it has to be a sharp knife, has to make sure that bud is exactly flat on the back side so that the cambium is matching the cambium. And that's the key to successful grafting. And the, and the flaps actually help hold the bud tight as well to the cambium layer of the, on the trunk there. And then you can see when he wraps that he's wrapping very tightly to try to minimize all the air that's going to be in there to help keep it from drying out. But he's doing a chip butt on this one right here versus a T or an inverted T and he has a reason for that. He probably feels it's a better chance for a take in there and that's what he did is he removed a little piece of wood and he's doing a, a typical chip like you would on a rootstock. But again, just as long as cambium is matching cambium, that's the key. So they've already relieved the, the hydraulic pressure right here. The trunks have already been slashed to help keep the sap flow coming up while and let that have a time to heal. Otherwise, that sap flow would be too much on this open wound now and push that bud out theoretically. So they come in and pre-cut these, and that's what this bleeding is down in here. It's not gonna hurt the vine. It's just a very shallow cut with a saw. Here's one that's already starting to push a little bit. Uh, again, I put a little nick in here in the trunk to relieve some of the hydraulic pressure and this one is actually starting to grow. And I think with all the warm weather, this is probably an indicator that this is going to take off pretty quick. And at some point then the crew will come through and start taking off the sucker so the energy and the effort can go into, into that new bud. The year of grafting is really the loss of 100% crop plus the conversion and then after that it's uh, going forward with your new variety or new clone. Two Corinthians 13 says, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? Resurrection Sunday is a time to examine. Did I get this thing? Have I got this thing? Am I united? If you're united, you'll have the life of God inside of you. If you're not united, it's a good moment to examine yourself. To say, my, my, my brother, I've got a lot of answers, but I don't have that union. If that's you this morning, I'd love to, to help you establish your union with Jesus. How do you get that? You have to acknowledge that you need Jesus to die on the cross on your behalf. You have to acknowledge before others that you died with him. Would you mind if all of us just stood together, friends, ask the band to come and lead us? The Bible says this union that you and I have at the cross with Jesus in his death, that union got marked with a seal, the seal of the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you this morning, can we allow the Holy Spirit to come and mark us again, to come and seal us again, to come and touch us again, to say, man, you are one. Can, you, can we trust the Holy Spirit to come and mark that place for us? The life of God that we carry now. 
If you're comfortable this way, would you mind to just raise your hands with me? Jesus opened his hands, his arms for us. Let us raise our hands this morning. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are the seal of the union that we have with Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you this morning for the strengthening of weak knees. Some that have doubted whether they've been grafted in, whether they've met Jesus in that place. Thank you, Holy Spirit, this morning that you come and that you seal us afresh. I ask this morning that you'll not just seal us, but that you would lubricate us, Holy Spirit. That you would smear us, Holy Spirit. We worship you this morning. I pray that our unity with Christ and the expression of the resurrection life, the expression of the resurrection power, that that wonderful experience would mark our lives, Holy Spirit, that we will walk with you. We will worship Jesus. We will worship by your Spirit, Lord. This morning, I declare freedom over your people. Freedom in the name of Jesus. Freedom because of the blood of Jesus. Freedom because they've been united with Him in death. And we know what happened next. I speak freedom, Lord. The release of curse. The release of oppression. The release of poverty. The release of disease. The release of death. Jesus. Come Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit.